All right. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Bob Runer. I am an AR Extension Educator with Purdue University. I work in Clay and Owen counties. And one of the things that is particularly great for me in the case of this program is that I am an entomologist. I've had a lot of opportunities to study several different kinds of caterpillars, several different kinds of butterflies and moths. So I've had a lot of opportunity to get to know them and the kind of lifestyles they lead. So I'm gonna dive a little bit here into just some of the biology and life habits of caterpillars so we can try to better understand them a little bit. By asking first the question, what exactly are caterpillars? I mean, most of us will see them, we'll go there these funny squishy things, and maybe some of you already are fully aware of the fact that they are immature butterflies and moths that will eventually, as they go through their life, uh, develop into a pupa inside of a cocoon or a chrysalis, and then hatch out as a moth when they reach adulthood. So a lot of this I've already said, but one thing that's really interesting is that while we here in the United States understand most caterpillars as being herbivores that can either be cute or annoying, depending on where you find them, there actually are carnivorous caterpillars. Uh, carnivorous caterpillars out there, different butterfly and moth species that do have carnivores when they're young. Um, they are not common and they're certainly not present here in the continental United States or North America. So if you see one, most likely you're looking at it inside of a zoo or a museum. I doubt you will ever encounter one in the wild. One of the reasons that we know so much about caterpillars too is that these guys are our exemplar for what we call complete metamorphosis. This very, very strange and unique process by which they can move from being a little funny caterpillar larva to a very pretty or very drab butterfly or moth adult. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at metamorphosis. This is one of my personal favorite subjects when it comes to butterflies and moths. Um, it's a insanely complex, biologically speaking. Essentially, when a caterpillar reaches a certain point in its development, it will create this pupa, this cocoon that it surrounds itself with, and it will quite literally break down almost the entirety of its body. Um, various important parts are going to remain intact, but most other ones are simply going to be broken down. And then the body is going to be reformed by totipotent cells, basically cells that can become anything, um, using these clumps of cells that exist inside their body called imaginal discs. So these discs will essentially spread out and guide the development of the insect as it shifts their hormones around at different times. When the insect is getting ready for this process, we entomologists have actually done a lot of research into it. And we discovered that they're a little bit similar to human development in that they balance hormones by dropping one and raising another. In the case of insects, however, instead of using human growth hormone, they use two of them, one known as ecdysone, which controls when they enter ecdysis or when they molt, and one is called insect growth hormone. Now, the speed of metamorphosis is going to be dictated very heavily by species, but also very heavily by the temperature. Insects are going to be inextricably linked to how warm it is outside. And the general rule is that the warmer it is, the quicker an insect will develop. This is also somewhat controlled by the time of year as well, because depending on the species, they may not enter metamorphosis until it's either late summer or they might do it very early in spring or they may do it through the middle. It's just going to depend on what kind of caterpillar we're looking at. In order to become an adult though, this is all controlled by one simple thing. How much was that caterpillar able to consume before it entered this stage of its life? If it had enough to eat, it will at least become an adult. If it got a decent amount to eat, it will become a healthy adult with enough energy to hopefully reproduce, lay eggs, and if they, as an adult feed, be able to have enough energy to fly around and feed themselves. Uh, the reason that we believe metamorphosis exists is that it will allow larvae and adults to use different food sources. So basically the parents won't be competing with the young for the food that they need to eat. Now, there are spots where that doesn't quite hold up. 
that matches for the most part with caterpillars, butterflies, and moths. Because butterflies and moths, either when they're adults, they may not even have a digestive system or mouth parts, mouth parts with which to eat, or they'll be consuming something like nectar, which is a very energy rich, sugary substance. And then the caterpillars are simply eating leaf tissue and getting their sustenance out of that. However, in some species that have complete metamorphosis, like some species of beetles, we find that the adults and the larvae actually consume the same foods. So it doesn't quite hold up across the board. So we as entomologists, we're still going to be doing lots and lots of research into this subject because there's still a lot of mysteries to uncover with it. Went a little bit backwards there. All right. So here's just a great picture I found of the pupa that insects enter. So you see that I've got the three words up there. I put pupa, cocoon, and chrysalis. Now, entomologists, we are going to use the term pupa. You may have learned the term chrysalis as you were growing up in school or whatever, which essentially is almost interchangeable with cocoon. Um, a cocoon, though, how it could be a lot of different things. It could be um, just something the insect covers itself with, like their, their, it, the appearance of their exoskeleton, or it could be a structure they actually build themselves using silk and, and detritus and bits of things around them to have more protection. Now, when they are in this pupil stage, they lack mouth parts completely. There's nothing there with which they can eat. And generally, they're going to be very dormant. You could pick them up and they will barely move at all. However, if you disturb them enough, some of them may twitch a little bit. Now, remember when I said that when an insect is in a pupa, its body breaks down almost entirely and then gets reformed. So that means that when you poke a pupa and it moves around, you're either just before or just after that stage. So that insect is at a stage where it actually has muscles with which to move. And I kind of pointed out already, these are often covered by silk or leaves or detritus found on grounds or plants. This is particularly true with a lot of our moth species. So moths typically will create silk that they'll use to move around and cover their food supply. And they'll also use it to create this cocoon that will stick to the surface of a plant where they'll go ahead and pupate inside of that cocoon. If you opened up the cocoon, if you actually cut it open, you would find the pupa of the insect inside of it, if that helps you understand it a little better. Um, and of course, just like with what I was saying before, the time of the year is going to depend on when they're present, where they are in their life cycle. Some of these insects are going to pupate over the winter. Some of them are going to pupate throughout the summer. You may see extra generations be able to get in within a given season. It just depends on what species you're working with. So one thing that will always remain true about caterpillars, they are eating machines. That is their sole purpose in life. Caterpillars are immature. So that means that they are incapable of reproducing. They are not adults. They do not have sexual organs yet. Those are developing inside of their bodies. So the only thing that they do is they eat. Now the activity is gonna follow a very simple pattern. And for those of you who are gardeners here, you're gonna recognize this pattern very, very easily. Their pattern is simply eat food, hide from predators and conserve energy wherever possible. They don't sleep. All they do is they enter a period where they're going to be moving around less, either to facilitate hiding from predators or to conserve energy, say, as it gets cooler around nighttime. Um, and of course, I mentioned already, they're not going to be spending energy on mating or laying eggs. These are not adults, so they don't need to worry about that. Their sole purpose is to grow. And they're going to grow quite a bit. So they're going to get very, very large compared to the eggs that they'll hatch out of. Their goal is to get enough food before they enter ecdysis or molting. And these guys are going to molt, depending on the species, of course, they're gonna molt quite a bit. What you're looking at here is an image of an insect that has gone through a molt. You can see its shed skin is kind of wrapped around its body a little bit. And you can see the insect very recently out of its molt, very, very soft to the touch and very pale in color. And that is a very common thing amongst insects just after they molt. Insects essentially wear their bones on the outside is what we teach a lot of kids. They have an exoskeleton. This means that all of their muscles, all of their organs, 
Everything is inside of an exoskeleton made of a material called chitin. This also means that when they grow, they can't just simply grow. They have to grow and then shed their skin to be able to continue to grow. Each time they shed or molt that exoskeleton, they're gonna look a little funny. Their head's gonna be really big and their body's gonna be really small because they just rose to another level that, where they can continue to expand. Now, thankfully, caterpillars are able to expand some anyways because they're soft-bodied. So that's why you see really, really fat caterpillars with really tiny heads. And when they get to that point, that's when they're going to have that ecdysone hormone trigger and it's going to tell the caterpillar, okay, it's time to molt. And then they're going to go through the process of shedding their skin. By the way, and I'm gonna go back a slide here for a moment. After an insect has shed its skin, you can see it's very pale. That means that it is extremely soft and they're very, very vulnerable. Many insects don't survive their molting process because their bodies could get damaged as they begin to shed their skin or sometimes even their fellow insects around them may consume them because they're a ready food source. Now, when a larva sheds its skin, we entomologists recognize that as a very important developmental landmark. We refer to, uh, we, we call molting obviously the same thing, they molt, they go through ecdysis, but that period in between ecdysis, we refer to as an instar. And depending on the species of insect you're looking at, they're going to have a very, very particular number of instars with very little variation in there. You may see a few insects that may have an extra instar, but in general, most of them are going to have a very tight growth period. And when you look up different kinds of insects and you learn how to identify them, you'll discover that some insects will very much have five larval instars before they become an adult. And for those of you who may be master gardeners who are trying to figure out how to identify different caterpillars, that means that you can take caterpillars, grow them, observe them, and be able to identify what they are if you can't figure that out. Um, now, these larval instars are going to have a lot of implications for the life cycle and the habits of these insects, including when and how they consume their food. Um, this is particularly important, say, for an invasive insect like the tussock sponge moth, which will crawl up and down trees, and that may depend on how big the insect has gotten. Very small ones may not do quite as much crawling up and down, for example. Or if you're looking at crop pests, the damage being done to different crops, such as corn or soybeans, is going to look different at different larval instars. So before I jump into the eating habits of insects, I did want to go over a little bit about the defenses that caterpillars have. Um, while they may look harmless, they actually have quite a few defenses. And I hope that most of you never have any cause to discover some of them because unfortunately they, they can be a little bit bad. Particularly when we are looking at the insect that we just saw here, which I'm gonna go into in a moment. So while we run, recognize that most caterpillars are not predatory, they're not gonna reach out and bite you and try to tear you up, they're still gonna have defenses that are either going to dissuade or allow them to avoid predators and other potential enemies. Now these defenses are gonna take a lot of different forms. They could be something like a pheromone release to give off a warning pheromone, a warning chemical that'll signal to somebody to back off, or they could be very good at camouflaging themselves against their predators. And they do have the ability, some caterpillars do have the ability to envenomate things that touch them, just like a bee or a wasp would. There are even species of caterpillars where they will eat a host plant that is extraordinarily toxic, and then they will take that toxin into their bodies so that way whenever a predator eats one of them, it will get sick and then they will never eat another caterpillar like that again. Uh, the parsnip webworm or the uh, monarch butterfly is an excellent example of that particular process. So a few caterpillars here that have some defenses that really kind of outline it. One that we do have here in Indiana, though I don't get very many calls about it, is the saddleback caterpillar. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever had the misfortune to encounter a saddleback. I hope you never have, but it is very important that you recognize a saddleback for what it is. You're looking at a great image of one. It has that telltale, telltale green back with a brown circle in the middle. It is impossible to miss. 
It will also have these four protuberances coming out of its body at all angles that will have lots of little spiky hairs on them. Now, the reason the saddleback is so bad is because those hairs contain venom. And what will happen is when you come into contact with those hairs and you get envenomed, you will, or envenomated, I'm sorry, you will experience something similar to a bee sting. It will knock you on your butt. I promise you that. Um, you'll start to feel burning, a rash will develop at the site, and then you'll get nausea and headaches because you have essentially been poisoned. Um, there are lots of things that are recommended to do, like using a baking soda poultice or other methods to get all of the stinging hairs out of your skin because you will not have just one hair. Um, and it is strongly recommended that if the person who has been stung is very young or elderly to please get them to a hospital. Uh, this is not a lethal injection. This is just one that can make you very sick. So if you ever see a saddleback caterpillar, take that warning coloration to heart and don't touch them. Just let them go about their business. They don't wanna be bothered and they're not gonna do any kind of damage that you're gonna recognize. Here is another example of a caterpillar with a really, really interesting defense. I actually love finding these. I've put several in collections. Um, the black swallowtail caterpillar. We have black swallowtails all throughout Indiana. They're very obvious, they're beautiful. And they also do this. So what you're seeing here, that is the head capsule of the insect that we're looking at. And just behind the head capsule, there is this funny inflatable protuberance ca called an osmeterium. Now what happens is that when this insect is threatened, um, the black swallowtail, also known as the parsley worm, um, what'll happen is it will inflate these set of funny orange horns. And those horns are going to give off a warning pheromone, a warning chemical message. It's going to tell predators and prey to back off. Now, some of the warning coloration that you see on its body comes from its food. So you can see I put there, it has a, various host plants, including parsley, carrots, and fennel. It's taking the secondary compounds in those plants and using them to create that warning coloration. So it's probably doubling down and also has a very bitter taste to it as well. And then one of my favorites is the giant swallowtail butterfly. This also has the other name, the bird poop caterpillar. Um, you can sometimes fall, found it, uh, find it being called the orange dog swallowtail as well. But the key thing is, is that when it's a caterpillar from above, it is going to quite literally look like bird poop on the surface of a leaf. Its camouflage is excellent. I have seen them in nature. And uh, yeah, you will miss them. Unless they move in an obvious way, you will not even think th anything about it. They also use an osmeterium as well to ward off predators. They'll have some orange horns that will pop out to warn things away and they'll exude a pheromone. However, predators have to find them first. They're very good at hiding. All right, so now to the part that I promised you guys, talking a little bit about caterpillar damage. And as I talk about damage, I'm also going to go over some of the control recommendations for a few of these. There are a lot of caterpillars that I could talk about this evening. Unfortunately, we just don't have that kind of time. So I'm going to cover ones that you will probably very readily recognize. Now, the thing about caterpillars is that they all have chewing mouth parts. That means that whenever they do damage, they are tearing, shredding, and ripping through leaf material. They do not have mouth parts like an aphid does where they can poke into a plant and drink sap from it. Caterpillars are just gonna chew things up. Um, that damage, however, may take several different forms depending on how that caterpillar treats its host. There are different ways caterpillars will approach their food depending on the host plant and the defenses of that host plant. So let's take a closer look. This is one that I'm pretty familiar with. Unfortunately, a lot of our farmers are as well, known as the European corn borer. This, is, uh, this comes from a moth that is fa from family Crambidae, so it's a Crambid moth, Astrinia nubilalis. Um, and they will attack corn. They will also go after a variety of other plants, including potatoes, beans, um, anything that's going to be a fairly robust vegetable crop, peppers is also included in there. So if you're a gardener, you may deal with these as well. 
Uh, the larva, what they're going to do at their earlier instars is they're going to start feeding within the whorl of the corn, deep inside that little whorl that's coming out of the ground. And then as the corn grows, they're going to descend into the stalk to feed inside there and on the developing ear. They're also going to take advantage of the tassel as well and feed on the pollen in there to get the protein out of it as well. So you can tell just by going back to this image that this doesn't look anything like some of the other caterpillars you may deal with in the garden. Here you have clear examples of boring damage where there's just the hole on the outside and then you can see the rot going through the pith. And if you unfold the whorl, you're going to see shredding damage in a really interesting pattern because due to the fact that it's feeding within the whorl, it's feeding through multiple layers of the grass leaves. Another great example of a caterpillar that feeds a little bit differently is a leaf miner moth. Now, leaf mining can cover a lot of different insects. It can cover sawflies, butterflies, moths, etc. In this case, we're looking at a leaf miner moth. There is more than one kind of moth species that will do leaf mining. Um, some of them are here in Indiana, some of them are not. This one we should be able to find in Indiana, uh, uh, Leucoptera sinuella. So what happens is the larva is going to bore into the space between the outermost layers of the leaves in species of poplar. It's taking advantage of the tougher outer layers of the leaf to feed on the inside. So that way, not only is it getting at the good stuff inside the leaf, it's also protected by those different layers. It's very hard to spray for them. Um, mainly, you just have to get rid of them as best you can or just deal with the damage. I will say that most leaf miners will not kill a tree. Uh, these, a lot of these are native to Europe, and they can be found also in Japan and North America because they do go for poplar species. They will attack native and invasive poplar species. And of course, our favorite friend that a lot of you know very, very well, the tomato hornworm. Now, this one is a great example of an insect that will just chew leaves like there is no tomorrow. They will chew on the outside of leaves. Their protection is what you see here. They blend into the color of the tomato plant. Now, these are actually two different species that are on two different kinds of plants, though I have heard that they can in, um, can't interchange depending on where you are in the country. Manduca sexta, which is our tobacco hornworm, which is more typical areas where tobacco is developed, and Manduca quinque maculata, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The larvae are experts at leaf consumers. They are going to shred the outside edge of the leaf. Think of them like a kind of typewriter. They're just going to chew that outer edge, and as soon as they reach the end of it, they're just going to go back and chew the edge down again and again and again. That's why you see a certain type of pattern as they go through leaves. These insects are extremely voracious eaters. Uh, they can go all day, all night, and you can actually hear them chewing their food once they get to a certain size. Um, if one of you ever gets brave enough to put your ear close to there, and I promise they won't bite you, give it a shot sometime. Uh, you can actually hear them chewing. There's actually a YouTube video that I wanted to show you guys. I just wasn't able to get it to work with the presentation. So look it up sometime on YouTube. Now, when we talk about control methods here, and we're going to focus on the tomato hornworm for the moment, there are several different methods that are available to you. In general, for me, I don't worry too much about hornworms on my tomatoes because usually they occur later in the development of the tomato plant, at least at my house. So I may pick them off. I think they're getting to be a little bit much. I just do hand removal. Um, you can also do a little bit of soil cultivation because they will pupate in the ground. So disking, tilling, if you have that capacity, that's going to destroy those pupa. Um, preserving the natural enemies around there by avoiding the use of pesticides and things like that, because there are parasites that will lay eggs on the backs of tomato hornworms that help you out. Birds and other predators are going to go after them because they're great food. You can also, if you do have it bad enough, there are plenty of pesticides that you can use on them, like permethrin, carbaryl, and just a selection of lots of them. If that's a choice that you want to go with, contact your local extension educator and we can help you figure out what's going to work for you. And of course, using a BT product will also make an impact on tomato hornworms. Those are products that contain the protein developed by a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, that is insecticidal. Won't hurt anything except an insect. 
Now, the key thing about a BT product is the insect has to consume it, which means it will have to consume whatever substrate it's on. So let's talk about another garden pest. Um, the cabbage looper is one that is very, very common in our gardens. Uh, I cannot imagine a garden in Indiana that doesn't have these. They are just all over the place. Now, these guys are a species known as Trichoplusia ni, where the adult form is this very, very nondescript brown moth. You'll know that they are about to occur when you see brown moths flying over your garden plants. So that means that putting up um, netting on hoops is a way to defend against their presence. They can do a lot of chewing damage to cabbage and other cruciferous vegetables. So that's why we typically see them. That's why they have the name, the cabbage looper. Now the cabbage looper is also noted because we go back to the previous slide, you can kind of see it already happening. They're missing what's known as a pro, pro legs. So in that, because they're missing some, that means that when they kind of do the inchworm thing, they'll form a loop as they move the back end of their body close to the front and then they'll shoot out the front end of their body to move forward. I also want to explain too, while I'm on the subject, pro legs. So if you have ever seen me teach a Master Gardener course, you know that I will teach our new Master Gardeners that insects have six legs. But if we look at this image, or the image of lots of other uh, moth and butterfly species, um, you'll note that they seem to have more than six. So what's going on here is that they have a kind of temporary set of fleshy appendages with hooks in them that we refer to as pro legs. These are not real legs. They don't really have muscles like their normal legs do, and they will disappear as soon as they rise into adulthood. All right. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention here, much like our tomato hornworms, uh, cabbage loopers will openly consume leaf material. So you, that's why we're able to see them. They're just going to be inching along plants and cutting little holes into them and chewing on the edges of leaves. So they won't burrow into anything and they won't mine. So like I mentioned, employing row covers is going to be a really good way to defend against these insects as soon as you see adults flying around your vegetable crops. If you see the adults and then they go away, you're too late. They probably already laid their eggs. Now, if that's already happened, there are different pesticides that work on cabbage loopers. However, natural enemies are nearly as effective as well. So I actually don't recommend pesticides for them. I would say do some monitoring, do some hand clearing of them, and let the predators do their work. Uh, BT products are fairly effective on them too at early instar, so you could try an application of that. Um, that should have minimal impact on natural enemies too, because the only way the natural enemy could get the BT product on them is if they actually ate the leaves of the plant. So if you're looking at a predatory insect, they're probably not gonna be bothered by it in the slightest. See, we also have a comment in the chat there, someone saying that, Tomato hornworms turn into beautiful sphinx moths, the five spotted hawk moth. Yes, they are gorgeous. They also can pollinate too. So um, you can, I always like to put to my classes like you, there's a bit of a double-edged sword when you clear off caterpillars and moth larvae, you may be losing a pollinator when you do so. So keep that in mind. All right, so we talked about the cabbage looper. Now let's talk about the cabbage worm. Yes, there is another type there. It is not an inchworm though. They will not have that funny looping motion. This is a species known as Pieris rapi, or rapé, also called the white cabbage moth. You'll recognize them very quickly because you'll see a very delicate looking white or yellowish moth with a single black spot on their forewings. Um, and they're very common. I'm sure all of you have seen them before. They are going to be most typical on cabbage, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, horseradish, plants of, the, of a similar vein. Now, like I said, they're going to be more crawling and they're gonna, I, in my opinion, they're a little bit smaller too. You're gonna to see them crawling along the edges and on top of the leaves. Uh, hummingbird moths come from a species that, well, you know what? That just flew right out of my head. I'll have to reply to you on that one. Uh, as soon as I double check that, because I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. All right, so uh, cabbage worms. So with cabbage worms, the control methods are essentially the same for the cabbage looper. You're going to be doing all the same things there. However, there is a lot of research going into entomopathogenic agents like viruses, particularly the granulosis virus, 
though the material that I most recently saw seemed to say that the granulosis virus wasn't any more effective than other things. So it'll be an area of continuing research. Host plant resistance is also a major area of study with these guys. And it's going to be a major area of study with all of our caterpillar insects. Um, so that's something that you may wanna keep your eye on. And you can talk to your extension educator on that one too, to see what could be out there that could offer some host plant resistance in terms of these insects. All right, so that's what I've got for you guys this evening. I've got my contact information here. I also have a link to our Purdue Ed store where you can find publications on all these insects and more, and a link to our Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. These are the people who can help you figure out what is going on with your plants if they're dying of a disease. Uh, you just send it a sample to them and they will help you answer that. And with that, I want to thank you guys for watching our program this evening.